Good afternoon, everyone. Um, we are doing actually things a little bit differently today. So I'm going to ask you, ask all of you to make sure that you're muted at the moment. And I'll explain a little bit more later. But uh, you are all on camera and you're, uh, you may have to mute yourself. So at any point, I am Phil Yoon. I am the chair of the Diversity, Equity and Inclusion or DEI team. And on behalf of Vice Chair Amy Coco and the rest of the team, I thank you all for attending. Typically, I would start off by saying that I'm proud the DEI team is sponsoring a program, but I think the right word today is grateful. I'm grateful that this program is being offered, and I'll tell you why. This program came together quickly because of a shock, an alarming sentence in a recent article. Roughly 31% of Black lawyers said they contemplated suicide during their professional career. Let that sink in for a second. 31%. That prompted an outreach to lawyers concerned for lawyers executive director Lori Besden with crucial questions. What can we as attorneys do to make a difference, to save lives, to help our colleagues, especially our minority colleagues? And I must first thank Trent Hargrove, Bridget Gillespie, and Susan Etter for putting the wheels into initial motion. But then Lori jumped right in. This program is targeted at you, the leaders to increase our awareness of the and stigmas and barriers some attorneys face and what prevents them from asking for or getting help. Once we have a better understanding, we can identify actions that each of us as bar leaders can take to make a difference. This program was designed to encourage connection between all of us to the extent that's possible in a virtual setting. It's important to know we're not alone and we have others to lean on when we face challenges and to also celebrate the victories. We encourage you to keep your cameras on unless you feel it would be best to turn yours off. You can set your Zoom to speaker view or fiddle with the settings however you'd like, but we want this to feel like a conversation among people who care about helping our colleagues and friends. So that's why we won't be using PowerPoints or visual effects, but we do ask everyone to stay on mute to avoid any background noise. And as always, we welcome questions either in chat or during the Q&A. But first, it is my pleasure and honor to introduce Kathleen Wilkinson, the president of the PBA, who has been a longtime advocate for attorney well-being. President Wilkinson. Thank you, Phil. Uh, we really appreciate your leadership this year and so many Pennsylvania Bar initiatives, and especially in putting this program together on very short notice. And it's also being attended by a very large audience today. And I wanna give special thanks to uh, the judges that are attending. Uh, and in particular, one of our attendees, Philadelphia Court of Common Pleas Judge George Overton, who is the recently installed president of the Pennsylvania of State Trial Judges, uh, which is really excellent that, that he's going to be and is in attendance. Um, as, as everyone knows, being a lawyer is extremely stressful. Lawyers report being at higher, the highest rates of stress among most professions. More substance abuse is used. There's more substance abuse on the part of lawyers than other professions as well. And as you know, quality of life, balance, mindfulness has been part of my favorite subjects and part of the work that I've devoted to the Pennsylvania Bar Association, particularly through the Quality of Life and Balance Committee. I am so happy that we're having this program today so that we can talk about the added stressors that we are experiencing right now as, as we try to get out of, but then are caught back into the COVID pandemic. You know, first we were happy, you know, we're having vaccines, we can go back to work. And now we're getting stressed again because we need maybe a booster shot and not enough people are vaccinated. And during the pandemic, women and minority attorneys in particular were extremely adversely affected. Many women and minority attorneys have less, left the profession of law. Women were sitting next to their children while learning school on Zoom, and they were trying to conduct depositions via Zoom it was just too much to bear. The PBA is committed to making the legal profession welcoming and inclusive to all attorneys so that we more accurately reflect, serve, and represent the diversity of lawyers throughout the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. 
I'm very proud of the relationships that we have developed and continue to develop with key leaders such as Lawyers Concerned for Lawyers, as well as our local and affinity bar associations who also are sharing in this important work. While none of us can fix everything and all the stressors that we're all going through, each of us attending this program can in our own small way um, show acts of kindness, as I always say, try to avoid being stressed you know, in, in civil proceedings or in the practice of criminal law, give extensions. Don't go low when the other side makes threats. Always conduct yourself with civility and respect because you will feel less stressed as a result. And judges don't want to see those type of nasty emails that sometimes go around. I also want to urge um, all of us to try to find at least one attorney of color who might like to serve in, as an LCL volunteer. I think Lori Besden will be speaking more about that in this regard. And I hope that all of us can use the knowledge that we gain today in today's program to go back to our other communities and approach lawyer wellness from a different perspective. A lot of us have been devoted to this for quite some time. And I want all of us to better understand lawyer wellness. If you see someone in your circle who seems to be you know, distressed or is being challenged or doesn't seem you know, happy, you know, just go over to them and you know, make a nice inquiry. You know, how are you? You know, nice to see you. Again, some of us are only seeing people on Zoom. But we're all seeing each other now. We can all see how we're reacting. Even a Zoom conversation or picking up the phone goes a long way. And lastly, I want to say that this pandemic has shown us that it's really hard to lead during these difficult times. There are times that there are so many things that we don't know. And, you know, there's things that are beyond our control. You know, programs that we thought we would be attending in person are no longer in person. Things are via Zoom, things are being canceled, but we are trying to have more events in person, as you know, and I hope I see some of you at our Back to the Bar event in September at Skytop. Um, let's listen today. Let's learn how to make life better for each other. And I wanna thank all of the speakers here and I look forward to hearing from all of you. And thank you to all of our attendees. So thank you, Phil, and I'll send it back to you. And I will continue to do what I can to help Lawyer Wellness continue to be part of our year this year as a PBA president. Thank you, Phil. Thank you, President Wilkinson. Really, how powerful is that? A longtime advocate of attorney's quality of life and our PBA president is making the commitment to becoming more informed about all of our wellness. That means we can do the same. And you all have already started doing that by attending these DEI programs and being here today. We have such important speakers and explanations of resources that I don't want to delay getting to, but it's important to set the scene first and provide context for what you are about to hear. First, I'll tell you why this topic resonated with me personally. Honestly, the beginning of the pandemic took a significant toll on my mental health. As an administrator, I was suddenly thrust into a situation where I needed to not only come up with emergency procedures to keep things up and running, but also ensuring the safety of my staff while staying up to date on the law. And to do so primarily from home, with basically no personal interaction with anyone was extremely taxing. I was exhausted each night with no energy. I'm not afraid now to say I sought help through online resources because I needed to figure out how to get my energy back. But at the time, that process added even more stress. As an Asian American, I was basically afraid, and you might even say ashamed, to tell anyone I was using wellness resources. This is not unusual, as the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration found that Asians were less likely to use mental health services than any other race or ethnic group. But you'll see that as a theme with almost all minorities, the stigma that could be attached to minorities who admit to mental health struggles. I'm happy to say that the sessions helped me to get my energy back, but that makes it ever the more important for me to want all our attorneys, and especially minority attorneys, to want access to all the wellness resources at their disposal. And so 
I want to quickly bring up a few thoughts that will shape our speakers' discussions. If you haven't had a chance to read it yet, Dylan, uh, Dylan Jackson's June 8th article in the Legal Intelligencer about minority attorneys' mental health struggles is truly eye-opening. This is where we got that 31% figure about Black lawyers and suicide, which dwarfs the figure of 19% of white attorneys who, con who con contemplated suicide. Still a high number, but that 31% figure is shocking. And we also learned that just about half of attorneys of color feel stressed simply because of their race or ethnicity. These were trends that continued and in many cases accelerated during the pandemic, with far more minority attorneys having admitted to suicidal thoughts than their white colleagues did. But then we also saw some truly powerful moments when Simone Biles spoke so candidly about her struggles with mental health. I mean, we're talking about Simone Biles, the greatest gymnast ever at the biggest athletic stage in the world. But she also bucked a major trend. 63% of African-Americans equate depression with personal weakness, according to a National Institutes of Health study. What Simone Biles did for the African-American community and what Naomi Osaka, the number one female tennis player in the world, did for the Asian community, it was open minds to the realization that there is incredible value in admitting to and recognizing mental health struggles. Just to put a lot of this into perspective, in one survey, 47% of lawyers of color and 53% of women of color felt at least some stress because of their, just because of their race or ethnicity. Black attorneys in particular struggled with that race-based anxiety at 31% compared to 12% of Asian and 5% of Hispanic attorneys. And yet, think of this. In 2015, among adults with any mental illness, 48% of white attorneys received mental health services, while only 31% of Black and Hispanic attorneys and only 22% of Asian attorneys did the same. As we start coming out of the pandemic, it's going to be absolutely crucial and necessary for the legal profession to address race and gender obstacles to help promote the wellness of their staff and organization. So I'm ever so grateful to introduce Laurie Besden, the Executive Director of Lawyers Concerned for Lawyers, or LCL. Laurie is not only an incredible leader in Pennsylvania, but also is recognized as one of the top LCL voices and advocates nationwide. We are, incredibly, we are incredibly fortunate to have her and appreciate the work she and all the amazing LCL staff and volunteers do to save lives and professional careers. Laurie, please take it away. Thank you so much, Phil, and thank you so much, President Wilkinson. I'm alive today. 17 years ago, one of the founders of LCL, John Rogers Carroll, reached out to a volunteer in Montgomery County, Dave, who reached out to me when I was in the darkest of my dark times. He shared with me his experience, strength, and hope. I related to Dave. I connected with Dave. When someone is struggling, it is A, so important that they're able to reach out for help. And it's even more important that they're able to relate to the person who is sharing a message of hope with them. We cannot hear hope from someone that we can't connect to and relate to. That is why we're here today. This program is a call to action. We all have something to offer others, all of us. We all have a Carfax, every single one of us. I wanna take a moment and thank the PBA, Trent Hargrove, Susan Etter, and Bridget Gillespie. If we've learned anything these past 18 months is that together we can accomplish what we cannot do alone. I wanna thank all of you for inviting LCL to this very important table. Serving the entire profession is LCL's mission. We are committed to reaching audiences that we've never reached before and continuing to break down the stigma that surrounds mental health and substance use truly an illusion that is costing us lives both in and out of our profession. This must stop. I say almost every time that I speak, substance use and mental health disorders and diagnoses are chronic, progressive, and fatal. If someone has cancer, they go to an oncologist. If they break a leg, they go to the ER. However, if somebody has substance use and mental health challenges, there's a stigma and literally people are scared and fear reaching out for help. They are medical diagnoses and together we can kill the illusion that is costing us lives. 
I'm truly honored to introduce three of LCL's board members to you today who are graciously agreeing to speak on our panel. All of our amazing directors serve as members of LCL's diversity committee. The first director that you're gonna hear from is LCL's newly elected president, Ned Spells. President Spells serves as a chief law clerk to the Superior Court Judge Olson. After President Spells, you're gonna hear from Judge Bouchard, who serves as a judge on the Philadelphia Court of Common Pleas, followed by Reginald Johnson, a Philadelphia-based attorney who serves as chair of LCL's diversity committee. Ned? Thanks, Lori. Uh, as Lori said, I, I am uh, the recently elected uh, president of LCL, and I wanted on behalf of LCL to thank uh, many individuals on the call today. Kathleen, as the PBA uh, president, I wanna thank you for your participation and prioritization of the issues that we're about to talk about today. Phil, I wanna thank you both as a colleague and as the team leader of the diversity and inclusion team at PBA for elevating this issue and for, organize, for your time and effort in organizing today's webinar. I'd also like to thank our local bar leaders who are attending. Uh, you are the ones that help LCL to carry the message to the members of your local organizations. And I'd also like to thank uh, LCL staff and particularly uh, our executive director, Lori Besden, whose efforts to expand LCL's message to all facets of our legal community in Pennsylvania uh, ha have been tremendous. Briefly, I was just going to comment on a couple of topics. Uh, first, the importance of asking for help and LCL's diversity efforts. When I think about asking for help, I start from the view that it, it takes a group effort to make the practice of law more civil, more inclusive, and a supporting environment. We're all responsible uh, for that outcome. Turning to stress, uh, I think we all have to acknowledge one thing about stress is that largely it's beyond our power to uh, eradicate from the legal profession. Heavy workloads, Deadlines, last minute and unreasonable demands are really here to stay in the practice of law. So how do we spot stress of concern, both in ourselves or others, or in particular in groups that may be most affected, but least amenable to our efforts? And what can we do about that? In my own experience, it's the stress that creates isolation, which is the hallmark of concern. Isolating stress causes individuals to view themselves as unique, unworthy, undeserving, or even incapable of receive, receiving help. Isolation erects barriers which individuals find difficult to overcome. This can involve a looping effect as well where the individual continues to suffer from the condition, the barriers uh, continue to grow and the condition worsens. Real or perceived, these barriers can grow more impenetrable by complicating factors such as race, ethnicity, gender, or sexual preference, as our data shows. Over time, these barriers can become impossible to overcome and the consequences can become tragic. Expanding the message that LCL, the PBA and local bar associations can serve as resources is our best tool in facilitating and supporting the process of asking for help. If people begin to perceive that help is available from someone with whom they can relate, our efforts are more likely to succeed. The presence of supporting resources is essential in the process of asking for help, whether it be for ourselves or on behalf of our colleagues. I'd also like to comment briefly on LCL's diversity efforts. As my own recent election can attest, 
LCL is committed and dedicated to making our board, our staff, and our volunteer base reflective of the legal community that we serve. In the past year, we have formed a diversity committee whose, mi whose mission is to expand LCL's message and tailor it to diverse affinity groups, both professional and student. By diversifying LCL's board and volunteer base, we can expand our commitment to areas of our legal community which have in the past been least served and may be more difficult to reach. I'd like to again thank you. And at this time, I will turn the, uh, the, the, the screen as it, will, as it is uh, over to Judge Bouchard. Judge? Ned, thanks so much. Um, it is a real privilege to be here. And uh, I want to thank everybody who's here today. And I really want to thank Zoom, because one of the things that has happened during the pandemic is it's enabled us to be with each other and meet each other in circumstances that otherwise would have been completely impossible. So it's not my, um, my preference, but I certainly can't deny that, but for Zoom, it's unlikely we'd be having this conversation. And it's also unlikely that we would have been able to respond as both Reggie and um, as both Ned and Lori have said um, to the article that brings us here today. I'm gonna to talk primarily about mental health and I'm gonna talk about my mental health. Um, I was elected in 2005. I, at the time, I was the first um, openly gay person who had been elected to a, um, a public office in the Commonwealth. And I ran as a judge, specifically, um, not, as a, not as a lesbian, an out lesbian, but that's who I was. And I, I was not about to, uh, to campaign otherwise. Um, but I want to talk about what Ned spoke of, the isolation, and when that has been uh, difficult for me in the course of being an attorney and how I was able to, to address it, um, thanks to the wonderful resources that, that are available to us. So I'm gonna go back a little bit. I'm gonna go back to law school, which uh, is not as long ago for, for me as it is for others because I didn't actually go to law school until 1990 when I was almost 40 years old. And I enrolled at Temple and um, I will never forget Con Law and Bowers v. Hardwick. Okay, that was the 1986 decision that uh, affirmed the criminalization of private consensual sex between adults. And I was in my con law class. There was, you know, 40 year old out lesbian. And I felt like every eye in the room was on me. Of course it wasn't. Of course my law, my con law professor had not in any way singled me out or suggested that this was uh, a topic on which I had, you know, extraordinarily intimate knowledge or I was able to speak of it. But that experience of being, of feeling my status my near status, my only status as a homosexual is perhaps one of the few things that made me feel I was at all competent even to speak today on this subject, which primarily concerns uh, the experiences of, um, of African-American lawyers. But I remember it acutely and I remember um, feeling all those things that Ned just described, less than, inadequate, hopeless, not worthy to be in that environment. Um, but I was very fortunate in a lot of ways because when I transferred from the evening division at Temple into the day division, uh, I suddenly found myself uh, hanging around with a group of other women who were approximately my age. And we had a lot in common. You know, We were pivoting in the middle of our lives, going back to school, picking up a dream that some of us had had a long time ago. And we also found we were all in therapy. Okay, no surprise, middle-aged women grappling with things. And one day we were sitting at lunch and we realized that we were spending as much in therapy as we were in tuition, okay? And we thought worth every single penny. I'm bringing it up because for me, law school was difficult as it is for most people. It was depressing. The day I graduated from law school, I felt like I had walked out of a rainforest into the sunshine. It was a low grade depression and I was able to get through it 
with tremendous support from my partner who then followed me to law school after I graduated, uh, but also from mental health professionals who were able to help me steer that course and not fall off the road into the, into the bushes and get me through it. Um, and that was probably one of my, I won't say one of my best experiences with mental health because I've never really had a bad experience with a mental health provider, but it was one of the ones that helped me understand that there was an, a part of me that was going to struggle perhaps in this new profession. And it was a good prep course. I'm, I'm going to fast forward a little bit uh, to the point where I was out of law school three or four years. Um, I'd been with a small firm that, um, and I separated from that firm and went out on my own. So I was flying solo and um, got into a really, really, really bad rut uh, where I was playing solitaire on the computer all day. Okay. I, I may be the only one in this august group who ever found themselves in that situation, but there I was. And it was concerning to me. It was concerning to my partner. And, um, and she was the one who pushed me back and said, Anne, come on, I think it's time you revisited that. Uh, either go back to your own therapist or find somebody new. And that, I think, was the first time that I really felt the need for medication. And I'm so glad I did. Because what I was going through was not something that I could have dealt with myself or could have been dealt with strictly through talk therapy. I needed um, what it is that we're all fortunate to have at our fingertips, which is uh, medical resources. And, um, and I did, and slowly after a couple of months, got through that, came back to the world of the living, came back to the world of being a productive lawyer. I'm gonna fast forward a little bit more, um, not that there were not bumps along the road to, to where I am today, but one of the reasons I agreed to, to do this today is because I'm, I'm pretty old. I just turned 70. And I, in keeping with the way I would like to think I've lived my life, which is to be relatively transparent and open, I realized that I might be able to say some things from this vantage point of age that other people couldn't, and that it may, uh, may have some, some use. Um, about six years ago, um, well, I come from a large Irish Catholic family, and about six years ago, uh, the one the one of the six that everybody loved, not me, <laughs> but the one that everybody was crazy about, was diagnosed with cancer, and it was stage four, and uh, it threw us all into a complete tailspin. And I um, found myself unable to sleep when I heard the news, and I just plummeted out of concern for him. Um, he died about uh, four months later. Uh, but not before um, we were all able to pull it together and um, and give him the kind of send off that I hope all of us have at the end of our lives. Uh, he was living in Oakland, California. I spent a lot of time out there, as did all of my siblings. And after he died, the next door neighbors came over and they said, you know, in all the time John's been here, we never heard that much laughter coming from his house because it was like you were having the wake ahead of time and he was there. But I'm bringing it up because it is one of those searing, another one of those searing times that we don't expect that throws us for a loop. And once again, I needed medication just so I could sleep, just so I could proceed with what I had to do. I was a judge at the time. I'm very grateful for um, a lot of the uh, freedoms that judges have, and that is um, the ability to, to separate ourselves from our work uh, perhaps with more ease than others, because at least in Philadelphia, there are so many of us who work together to make sure that the work gets done. And, um, and, um, and that was that. Was that. Um, so what I'm, I guess what I'm trying to convey is the significance of having uh, mental health resources and the ability to recognize when we simply are too deep in the water to do much more than tread water, and that's not enough. I want to segue into LCL and, um, and my involvement in LCL. I, I got involved in LCL um, before Lori was the executive director when there was a call for volunteers. And um, I volunteered, did a little bit of minimal training, and then made myself available. Uh, 
the, the newest offshoot of LCL is JCJ, which is Judges Concern for Judges. And I, I don't know how many people um, are familiar with Judges Concern for Judges, but it functions pretty much identically to LCL in that it offers uh, deeply confidential and supportive services at no cost, including an evaluation for people who believe that that will assist them in figuring out where their, their issues, um, are the issues that need to be addressed. Um, I'm bringing it up because we all have obligations under our various codes of ethics to see that individuals who are struggling in their uh, practice or in their profession, um, get the resources that they need. And that goes for our judges as well. I'm going to come back again to a word that, that Ned talked about, and that is isolation. As wonderful as it is to be a judge, because A, you never have to worry about what you're wearing, right? And B, you're almost always right. Even on appeal, frequently, you're going to be affirmed more than you're going to be overturned. Um, but it is an incredibly isolating experience. And if you're having problems, chances are good that they will fester before anybody calls them to your attention. Festering means, for the most part, self-medicating, self-treating, engaging in behaviors that are ultimately very destructive to the self, but also destructive to the workplace. So what I've been able to do as a volunteer for LCA prim primarily is to listen and for JCJ. Uh, when there are calls from judges um, and, and uh, the caller is asked, do you want to speak to a peer? We're there. And mostly what I've done um, when I've been able to help is to listen. And, and I've been able to, to offer that, that ear. I've, I've also occasionally been asked to, to speak with a judge who's, who's suffering uh, from substance abuse disorder and help them find resources. And for those on the call who may not know it, there is a very wide and robust network of lawyers meetings, lawyers and judges meetings throughout the entire Commonwealth. I think every county has one. Uh, in Philadelphia, our Tuesday night lawyers meeting has been going strong for well over 30 years. Interestingly enough, it is thriving on Zoom. We haven't met personally since March of 2020, but we have more people than ever that are able to participate. This is a support group. It's doing wonders. Thanks to Lori, we're also being we're also able to reach law students, and we're getting ready for another new crop of law students as Lori does her orientations with all of our law students. And uh, I I can't I'll just say for myself and for the other members of the Tuesday night group, when a young law student comes in with the self awareness that they have a problem and they know they need support, it's it's energizing for the entire group because we understand that this is somebody who's facing issues that many of us did not face until 20, 30 years into our career. And it, it gives us all a lot of hope. So that's what I just wanted to talk about, my own experiences, uh, my great, great gratitude for the resources that I have and, my, and uh, the life that I've lived. I mean, I joke, how lucky can one woman be to be a lesbian, wow. To have a substance abuse disorder, oh, wow. <laughs> Double rainbows for everybody. And to be a judge, oh my God. <laughs> so we'll just leave out the Democrat part because that's, that's asking for a lot. But, um, but I'm grateful to be here today and to share um, my own experiences and to encourage everybody on this, this call to do as, as Kathleen has suggested. Open up listen, be hospitable, note when somebody's in distress, be that hand to help them. And why do we do it? Because our judges and our attorneys are our resources. I won't go so far as to say they're our family because a lot of them, I would write them out of the will and so would all of us, but they are our resources, they're valuable. It's an investment, it's our own future in our profession. So. Thanks very much for this opportunity, Laura. You had to drag me kicking and screaming, but I'm glad that you did. And at this point, I'm going to turn it over to my friend, Reggie. Thank you so much. Thank you, Judge Bouchard, affectionately known as Anne. 
Good morning. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Reggie Johnson, and uh, I'll start off by saying I'm a 67-year-old recovering alcoholic addict. And I say that because there were many, including myself, that didn't think I would make it past the age of somewhere between 18 and 20, uh, because my use had started early. Based on my experience and a lot, and largely of what I've heard today uh, and in some reading preparing for today, I recognized that I had mental health issues as a very young child. I was never diagnosed, even as a child or an adolescent or even a, a, a young adult. But I think about my isolation, my feeling, I, I was an introvert. I was the oldest of four children. I was an icebreaker and I was my father's favorite and he went all out to make sure that I wanted for nothing. And by the way, Alcoholism, addiction, and mental health issues are equal, are equal opportunity diseases. They don't care what your economic status is in life. I had, I wanted for nothing. My father was a surgeon, an oral surgeon. My mother was a registered nurse. He lived well in a, in a uh, upper middle class neighborhood, a melting pot, if you will, Mount Airy, Pennsylvania, uh, Philadelphia, Mount Airy section of Philadelphia. I had, I, I, I lacked nothing but I wasn't comfortable in my own skin. I was a person, a being, waiting to learn how to feel better by way of putting substances into my body that would take the quote unquote edge off, would allow me to be able to, so I thought, interact, communicate well with others. But I was numbing myself to my true feelings. And um, so at the age of 14, I think I had my first marijuana uh, you know, joint and, and some beer. And I learned how to feel better. It wasn't real, but I felt better. And it was what I thought was a solution. And I started and, you know, I left private school because I'm an African-American male, but I wasn't dark enough to be black. I wasn't light enough to be white. I felt caught in the middle and again, isolated. And it was very real then. And even when I think about, um, <laughs> I start to uh, choke up a little bit when I think about the pain that I felt, which was real, re was real. Um, it still hurts a bit. But fast forward, I, um, to college at uh, Tufts University, just outside of Boston, Metro Massachusetts. And I gravitated to the upperclassmen who knew how to drink because that's what made me feel good. It made me able to relate, so I thought. And I got in some very serious trouble. And I have to talk about this because this is a part of my story, a very real part of my story. I got in some really serious uh, criminal trouble with two friends and um, we were prosecuted and ultimately went to prison. Now, I was able to come back, finish school. It, it was a robbery, by the way. And I was able to finish school. Uh, I applied for a governor's pardon and I, I got it. Um, even though I suffered from real strong feelings of insecurity, not measuring up, being consumed with the fear of failure, I would always continue to plot on. And that to me was a gift from God because I, don't, I didn't think I had that. And that permeated my life up until probably about 12 years ago. I was first introduced to recovery back in uh, 86, so you do the math, what's that? 35 uh, years ago, I had 12 years of continuous sobriety and on large measures because of uh, John Rogers Carroll that was mentioned by uh, Judge Bouchard, who was instrumental in starting the lawyers Tuesday night meeting in Philadelphia. Um, but I started going there back in the early 90s and I didn't hit my stride in recovery until 2009. So it just tells you what was happening in the meantime. And what was happening is 
you know, I also not only law school, I went to business school and I was trained to solve other people's problems. So therefore you could not tell me that I wasn't going to be able to solve my own problem. Bad outlook on life because I kept failing. I kept failing because I had to get out of the way. I had to get out of the way. I had to learn how to ask for help and then be willing to accept that help and not question it. And not being able to do that for a long time almost killed me. So I met uh, John Rogers Carroll and a bunch of other wonderful people. And I started going to that Tuesday lawyers group. Um, and as Judge Bruchard says, it's gravitated toward uh, you know, the Zoom format. But it's, it's still effective and very intimate because you can get right up in somebody's face. You can hear them. You can feel them. You know, I miss the in-person meeting because you can get hugs and things of that nature, which are also valuable to me. But LCL is something that is so true, so dear to me. I, I think I've been a volunteer now for somewhere around 12 years. And, and, and coincidentally, or not so much coincidentally, that's how much sobriety time I have. I get calls every so often from LCL staff that we got a prospect, can you reach out to them? And um, the thought to say no never occurs to me because it's just not something that I do. I was asked to participate in this. No was not an option because I believe my life was spared um, to help others, period. I primarily do uh, criminal defense work. And so therefore I have 12 step opportunities all the time to share, to try to improve lives. Um, I almost became a prosecutor a long time ago. And uh, that's not how I'm built. I wanted to do that because I had been to prison many, many years ago. And I thought if I did that, then it would just show that I'm really a good guy. And it took a long time for me to stop worrying about what other people think about me and just do it. So, um, Sobriety has been wonderful for me and I can only do it when I give back. And that's what I do with LCL. And then I was asked to join the board. I thought that was an honor. And then I was asked to chair the diversity and inclusion committee, the diversity committee. And uh, so it just keeps getting better and better and better. Um, Lori, I gotta thank you. You know, Lori just provides opportunities for all of us that are involved as volunteers and on the board to just to be of service and to do more. Um, I go to 12 step meetings all the time um, because my disease of addiction, I don't think will take a, will take a vacation. You know, I, I gotta keep remembering where I was. And uh, it allows me to be able to carry the message to other prospects. So I encourage those who can who are on this Zoom meeting, who can uh, spread the word to attract volunteers in your various uh, counties to do so. Um, it is an invaluable experience. When I reach out to someone who's struggling and I hear their voice and I get to talk to them and they get to thank me for spending the time, <laughs> I oftentimes will say, no, thank you for listening to me, because I want to get to keep what I have by giving it away. So um, that's really all I have. I wanted to share that history and um, the success story that I have become. I don't say that egotistically. I say it because I've been willing to accept help. I've been willing to give help. And in that balance, I get to keep what I have. I'm going to turn it back over to Laurie, I think it is. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Reggie. I don't think I can even follow that. Um, and Judge Bouchard and Ned, I cannot thank all of you enough for sharing your experience, strength, and hope with all of us. You represent LCL and JCJ, who we are, what we do, and why exactly we do what we do. I can say I've called on all three of you all hours of the night, weekend, evening, and I've never received a no, I can't help ever. The answer is always yes. Pre-pandemic, two landmark studies were conducted in the legal profession in the last five years. 
indicating the prevalence rates of substance use and mental health challenges where one in three legal professionals will struggle in their careers. Add the pandemic, add the racial injustice and police brutality that we've seen in this country, add the vicious attacks on the Asian American community. The data in the article that prompted this program states that attorneys of color and other marginalized communities are disproportionately struggling with high rates of mental health now and not seeking and reaching out for help. Add that 51% of attorneys of color do not feel supported by their law firms when it comes to well being. Black attorneys also reported that they do not feel comfortable taking time off from work because they, they are fearful that it will impact their career trajectory. 61% of attorneys of color feel isolated in their own law firms. Let me say that again. 61% of attorneys of color reported not feeling, feeling isolated in their own law firms where they are working. It is our responsibility to come together so everyone feels safe asking for help, feels heard, and can relate to the folks that they reach out to for support. As far as LCL goes, we're in our 33rd year. We have 27 directors, and I'm really proud to say six of them are diversity leaders. We have seven phenomenal folks on our staff. We recently hired an additional resource coordinator to help us handle the influx of requests for help that we've received in 2021. I wanna briefly talk about the trends that LCL has experienced in 2021. Should not be a shock. As far as the first eight months of this year, 76% of all presenting issues to LCL and JCJ are presenting with mental health challenges. The first four months of 2021, 18% increase in call volume over any year prior in our 33 year history. Take the last 72 hours, for example. We had a, a client call suicidal ideation with a plan. One of our amazing resource coordinators walked that person with a family member through to the emergency room. We've had a judge call regarding anxiety. We've had a family member of a judge call who was dealing with utilizing alcohol to self-medicate for mental health um, issues they're experiencing. Family members of attorneys and judges. This is all in the last 72 hours. Our profession is struggling. Folks of color and other marginalized communities have been disproportionately impacted by the pandemic. Programs like this are intended to raise awareness and to bring everyone together to bridge this gap. It is all of our responsibilities to do so. Action begins here, it begins today, and we need all of you. We have so much work to do together, but together we can definitely move mountains. We've already started. I wanna briefly talk about LCL services. Um, they're very relevant and I want everyone to know what we offer and who we offer as far as family members. Lawyers, judges, family members, and law students. All of our services are available to you. I was also recently asked in a program, will you help support staff who works for an attorney or a judge? And the answer is absolutely yes. We have never had somebody call us and we've said, Sorry, we can't help you. If somebody has the courage to pick up the phone and ask for help, you better believe that we're gonna help them. Anything substance use, mental health related. I no longer need to ask, We've, we're all walking through a pandemic. Every single person on here and in your memberships and your communities, we're all walking through trauma. All of us, the pandemic, nobody predicted that. If we don't work through this trauma, it manifests itself in our bodies and comes out as physical ailments. We all need to navigate this together. All of LCL services, free, absolutely confidential, safe, supportive. You can call us and say, my name's Anonymous Anonymous. We don't care what your name is, your identity. We literally save lives and we're here to help. We're 24 seven. I don't say that lightly. We've received more after hours calls in 2021 than we ever have in our history. These issues are not nine to five. Those of us in recovery, it's not a nine to five situation, it's 24 seven. We could not do and reach all of the people we do if we didn't have the unconditional support of the Pennsylvania Supreme Court and our funders, who is the Disciplinary Board and Lawyers Fund for Client Security. Without that support, we would not be able to do everything that we do. 
briefly to talk about our services. Um, we offer an evaluation and assessment with a healthcare provider. And we have over 151 healthcare providers covering all 67 counties, over 250 different locations. Majority of those providers are seeing people over telehealth. That provider during the assessment will make a diagnosis and a recommendation of treatment. If somebody, and again, we also assist family members of lawyers and judges, anyone in your family that's struggling is on our radar. If somebody has financial obstacles, we will find a way to work through that they are able to receive the treatment they need. We pay the initial session, thereafter we'll go into somebody's insurance. I'm gonna briefly just say lawyers, judges, and law students, John Rogers Carroll, late wife, um, and Patricia Carroll, there was a fund set up in her memory that literally for decades has been helping to assist lawyers, judges, and law students with funding for treatment who cannot otherwise pay for it, but who remain willing and very motivated. The bottom line, if somebody needs help and they're asking us for help, we're gonna get them help, period. I wanna also say at this point, because it's important to say this, the point of this program is not even just to diversify our peer base and ultimately our, continue to diversify our board, but if anybody on this program knows of a healthcare provider who is a minority provider, we want to hear from you. We want to continue to diversify our healthcare provider network. Again, many of us have talked about how important it is to feel that the person or the organization you reached out to for help understands you and you feel you can relate and identify with them. We wanna make sure that our provider network is as diverse as the calls that we receive please, you can email me. We need to help bridge this gap together. Peer support, and Judge Bouchard was talking about this, as well as Ned and Reggie. We have over 300 volunteers across the Commonwealth. Anyone that has walked through darkness and made it through the other side, very much like Reggie just said, we serve as peer volunteers because we can only keep what we have by giving it to others and sharing it with others. This program is, again, a call to action we would love more minority volunteers across the Commonwealth. You don't have to be a person in recovery. Like I said, we have all now walked through the pandemic together. We've all experienced stress. We all have something to offer to the next person who's struggling. And just like Judge Bouchard said, sometimes it's simply just an ear. Recovery meetings, these were mentioned as well. Uh, we have 13 recovery meetings for the legal profession across the Commonwealth. The positive and amazing news is 11 of those are meeting over Zoom slash hybrid at this point. So if you happen to know a legal professional in recovery, even if they don't want to attend a meeting in their county, they can jump on from Philadelphia to the Pittsburgh meeting and attend a meeting, and they can also attend a meeting with their camera off. There's not a camera on requirement, and they can take their name off the screen. Again, we're just a lifeline to help connect the legal community with resources. Our website, and this has already been discussed, uh, the resources for this program are listed on our website. On our website, we have a wealth of information, the COVID resource guide that we've been updating, um, BIPOC resources, LGBTQ resources, all types of resources. Also, one of the services that we offer, if there's a book that came out or any book on substance use, mental health, if we don't have it in-house, we will order it from Amazon and have it sent to you free of charge, absolutely. I wanna take a brief moment and talk about interventions. Um, as we're all on Zoom, and while it's a great way to connect, it's not the preferred method. It's hard to tell when somebody's struggling on a screen, but we're starting to filter back, and LCL is starting to see an increase in calls regarding other folks. Usually on a normal year, um, Intervention calls would account for about one third of all of contacts to LCL and JCJ. In the last 18 months, I'm gonna say that's dropped to about 25%. If you sense somebody is struggling very much like Phil said and, and President Wilkinson said, be the person to reach out to them. If you know someone is struggling, please reach out to us. Often people will call and say, I, I don't, I don't wanna report anybody. We, we save lives. We are not involved with a law license. We do not report anywhere. So when you call us, it's literally because you care about somebody and you're trying to help them. We'll help guide a converse, guide you to have a conversation with them. And if that if you're not a person that can reach them, you just know there's an issue, call us. We will find a way to reach them. 
please don't do nothing. If you know, and I say this often when I speak, but if you saw someone drowning, you wouldn't walk by and say, eh, I really don't want to get involved. It is your business. We're all in this together. We're all coming together and we absolutely need this call to action. We need to look out for each other. Um, if you hear that somebody has lost a child or a family member, or you see a name in a newspaper, contact us so we can then reach out to that person or family and offer them support. We are here, we care. I wanna thank every single person that is attending this program and or watching it on replay and let everyone know we are here for you 24 seven. Thank you all for showing up to the table of solution. At this point, I'm gonna turn it back over to Phil. Thank you so much for including LCL in this program today. Thank you, Lori. And really a, a big thank you for all that information and really the powerful stories we heard from Judge Buchart and from Ned and from Reggie. Uh, you know, and all these DEI programs, these personal stories really are the ones that hit close to home. And I think to have those personal stories increase our awareness of both our personal struggles and with our colleagues' struggles, that's just going to make such an impact in our legal community that I know the diversity, equity, and inclusion team is going to be working with this, with this information. And um, it, it's really going to impact a lot of the things that we do. So I'm very grateful for everything we've heard. 